Visual and Hearing Changes in the Elderly, presented by Celia Brown and Michelle Gustafson. So, what are the recommendations for visual screening in the elderly? The United States Preventive Services Task Force recommends that there is little evidence or uncertain level of evidence for glaucoma screening of adults greater than 65 years old. Despite the lack of direct evidence to support vision screening, evidence on effectiveness of treatments for common causes of impaired visual acuity is strong. So here's something that will make you think twice about not checking your elder's visual acuity. The human visual system deteriorates throughout adult life and 24% of those 80 years and older have additional vision impairment due to aging. A 60-year-old receives one-third of the retinal illuminance that a 20-year-old receives for the same light level. Please enjoy this simulation of vision impairment. Believe it or not, it happens to all of us. What's that? Presbyopia. Literally means aging eye. There's also a diminished ability to see well in dim light due to decrease in pupil size and increases in light absorption of the lens. Crystalline lens becomes less flexible and less able to accommodate. Please click on the video below to see the visual demonstration of what happens inside of our eye. When you focus your eye, tiny muscles actually pull on the lens, changing its shape. When you're young, the lens is flexible, so it's easy for those muscles to focus the lens on whatever you want. But over time, the lens gets stiffer. It becomes a struggle to pull it into shape, especially for seeing up close. Light starts focusing behind your retina instead of on it, and the images sent to your brain? Blurry. By your early 40s, your lenses will lose enough elasticity that you'll probably notice when you read at a normal distance. Eventually, they'll barely flex at all. But it's normal, even if you've always had perfect vision. And that is why everybody gets presbyopia. You've seen the video, so now let's talk a little bit more about pathophysiology to reinforce what is presbyopia. To form an image, your eye relies on the cornea and the lens to focus the light reflected from objects. Presbyopia is caused by a hardening of the lens of your eye, which occurs with aging. As your lens becomes less flexible, it can no longer change shape to focus on close-up images, and as a result, these images appear out of focus. When you're administering that Snellen eye test, it's good to know what's normal vision. Normal vision acuity is greater than or equal to 2040. Visual impairment is suggested at a visual acuity greater than or equal to 2040, but less than 2200. Legal blindness is an acuity of less than 2200 in the better eye, or total visual field less than 20 degrees. So who's at risk? Really, we all are. Age is the greatest risk factor. Certain medical conditions such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and multiple sclerosis. Drugs that you may prescribe to your patients, such as antihistamines, antidepressants, and diuretics, can all impair vision. So what will you as a clinician see when your patient comes in for a visit? They might have complaints of changes in distance vision, such as that ever-common trombone vision, moving of objects back and forth, sliding back and forth so that they can see. Dry eye is also another complaint, and it's particularly common in women mild foreign body sensations, burning, tearing due to mild corneal irritation, and small fluctuations in vision. Visual impairment can have serious implications for our elder population. Visual impairment may cause social anxiety, isolation, depression, loss of independence, and increased falls. How does this all happen? 
One study indicates that additional years with eye examinations are related to vision-related functioning, both in reducing decline in vision and improving functional status, especially in independent activities of daily living. Poor vision may mistakenly attribute inappropriate behavior solely to severe cognitive impairment when visual problems really are to blame. Poor self-rated vision in late life contributes directly to lower mental health and also indirectly by restricting individuals' ability to carry out routine, day-to-day -day physical activities and increasing their feelings of social isolation. So why does it matter that older people are affected by impaired vision? Because they may not adapt as quickly to impairment. Older patients may be less likely to report symptoms, and also it may go unnoticed and considered a normal part of aging. Your patient's inability to see may compromise their medication. Seniors may not be able to read directions on bottles and take medications inappropriately. Seniors may also take medications based on the shape of the pill, and when the pharmacist gives them a different pill, they again may take their medications inappropriately. Seniors may not see well enough to cut a tablet in half thus taking more than the prescribed amount. Preparing weekly medications and removing medications from original bottles may lead to unwanted complications and or adverse drug events. What can you as a provider do to test your patient's visual acuity? The American Academy of Ophthalmology recommends eye exams every one to two years beginning at the age of 65. You could test visual acuity left and right separately. Use habitual glasses to test distance. Make sure that you're using bright ambient light. Check the visual field by confrontation. Test left and right eyes separately. Have the patient fixate examiner's eye opposite of the patient. The examiner shows figures in four quadrants of patient's visual field. The patient then counts those fingers. Make sure to check pupils. Check direct and consensual response to light. Try the swinging flashlight test. Check extraocular extra motility. Observe the patient with both eyes open for strabismus. Test motility of the left and right eyes separately. Have the patient look up, down, right, left with head fixed. Try external observation. Observe lids, lashes, conjunctiva, and cornea. And still fluorescein, illuminate eye with cobalt blue filter on direct ophthalmoscope. Direct ophthalmoscopy. Darken room illumination. Observe rid reflex in pupils. Examine the optic disc, macula, and vasculature. What could you do if you find that your elder has visual impairment? Refer them to the ophthalmologist. Glasses and contact lenses are great options for treatment, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a prescription glasses. An appropriate option may be those simple glasses, reading glasses, that you buy at the pharmacy. Refractive surgery may be an option if your patient has cataracts. Corneal inlays are also an option. And finally, lens implants may are available if your senior needs them. There are some things that your patient can do to preserve the vision that they already have. Make sure they have their eyes examined on a regular basis, and even more so if they have chronic conditions such as diabetes or multiple sclerosis or cardiovascular diseases. Make sure that they wear sunglasses. Eat fruits and vegetables containing beta carotene. While that won't improve vision, it will preserve the vision that they have. Make sure that they wear protective eyewear when needed, such as mowing the lawn. Wear the right glasses. Don't wear your neighbor's glasses or your spouse's glasses. Make sure you wear the glasses that are appropriate for your vision. How about turning on the light? And lastly, pay attention to your body. If you have any symptoms that are concerning, make sure that you go to your doctor. Certain things should not be ignored in your elderly patient, or in any patient for that matter. Sudden onset of decreased visual acuity, even with correction. Report of distorted vision, straight lines appear curvy. Sudden appearance of visual field defect. Refer, refer, refer immediately. 
The next issue we'd like to discuss is auditory deficits and or hearing impairment. Changes of the auditory system of the geriatric population are common and incremental. These changes affect one-third of people over the age of 65 years, and they can be caused by genetics or environment. Hearing loss can be mild, moderate, or severe. The next slide is a video simulation of hearing loss, mild, moderate, and severe. Please enjoy it as it is a flashback to Flintstones days. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Aha! Uh -huh. You're on my apartment building on Granite Avenue. You owe me 300 bucks. Get it up. Fred, take it easy. It's only a game. Wilma, I'm just like them big tycoons. I play to win. Now, Barney, pay up or get out of the game. Football busted. That's one down and two to go. Betty, it's your turn. I don't have any more money either. You got it all. Then I'll take the mortgage on your open home. Well, come on, take the bank. Well, you don't just sit there like a dummy. I will not have you talking that way to our guests. Come on, Barney. I think we'd better go home. There are three major categories of hearing impairment in the geriatric po population. Conductive hearing loss, sensorineural hearing loss, and mixed hearing loss, which is a combination of conductive and sensorineural hearing loss. The pathophysiology of conductive hearing loss is as follows. There is a change in structure in geriatric ears. It, there's a degeneration of cochlear conductive membranes. This makes for a change in function, which is an inability to hear all frequencies. The loss is more pronounced at higher frequencies. The next slide is a simulation of conductive hearing loss. A conductive hearing loss is a problem in the outer or middle ear that prevents sound from reaching the inner ear. For example, a blockage or deformity in the middle ear can prevent the ossicles from vibrating properly. There are several causes of conductive hearing loss. These include impacted cerumen or wax, which is the easiest to take care of actually. Um, you can have osteomas, which are tumors of the middle or outer ear, otosclerosis, which is a degeneration of ear nerves, and fluid in the middle ear, which would cause conductive hearing loss. Sensorineural hearing loss is impairment to the inner ear, whereas conductive hearing loss is more specific to the outer ear. Sensorineural hearing loss is due to impairment to one or several organs and or connections of the ear. It can occur gradually or suddenly. The pathophysiology of sensorineural hearing loss is as follows. The following changes in structure affect the following changes in function. When you have cochlear hair cell degeneration and loss of auditory neurons in the organ of corti, you're going to have an inability to hear high frequency sounds. When there is a decreased vascularity of the cochlea, you're going to have equal loss of hearing of all frequencies. And if there is a loss of cortical auditory neurons, you're going to have an inability to disseminate localization of sound. This is the pathophysiology of sensory neural hearing loss. There are several conditions that commonly cause sensory neural hearing loss in the elderly. Um, presbycusis is the most common form in its hearing loss in the high frequency ranges of the decibel table. It includes sounds in ranges like S, SH, and F. The noise damage often causes sensory neural hearing loss because that affects the hair cells in the inner ear infections, autoimmune inner diseases, systemic and vascular, vascular diseases are also um, conditions that cause sensory neural hearing loss in the elderly. Further conditions that commonly cause sensory neural hearing loss in the elderly are uh, tumors of cranial nerve 8, a Meniere's disease, plain old trauma to the inner ear, radiation, if you have a patient having thyroid issues and they're being radiated or 
or anything like that. That can cause sensory neural hearing loss. And autotoxicity, which means that certain medications cause hearing loss by damaging the inner ear. A list of those autotoxic medications include aminoglycosides like gentamicin, vancomycin, or erythromycin, loop diuretics like furosemide, otherwise known as Lasix, or torsemide, NSAIDs, which include aspirin and ketorolac, and you have antimalarials like quinine that cause autotoxicity to the geriatric or anyone's ears, really, but by the time they're in their geriatric stages, they are having sensory neural hearing gloss specifically related to these med medications. This is a simulation video of sensory neural hearing loss. A sensory neural hearing loss is the result of a problem in the inner ear. Sensory neural hearing loss occurs when hair cells in the cochlea are missing or damaged. These hair cells are responsible for producing precise electrical signals that the brain needs in order to interpret sound. What are the implications of hearing loss for the geriatric population? Well, hearing loss is the third most prevalent chronic health condition in older adults. Hearing impairment affects the elderly differently from other age groups because it may be considered a sign of normal aging and may not be recognized or addressed in the home or healthcare setting. This may leave the geriatric population suffering for long periods of time without proper hearing. It does decrease quality of life as it is strongly correlated with depression and reduces stimulating input and interferes with social interaction. It correlates with poor memory and executive function. It can affect driving performance and safety, which will then go hand in hand with stimulating input and interference with social interactions. In a study by Siaba et al., hearing loss was found to cause behavioral reactions such as bluffing, withdrawing, and blaming. It causes emotional reactions such as loneliness, isolation, and anxiety and it causes cognitive reactions such as confusion communi and communication disorders. In a study by Lynn et al., hearing loss was associated with incident dementia and all case dementias. These cases of dementia increased with hearing loss severity and for persons over the age of 60 years. Assessment, Evaluation, and Diagnosis of Hearing Loss in the clinic setting, you should include noting problems during the conversation. Does your pa patient ask you to repeat often? If he or she does, you may conduct a whisper test, which is you standing behind the patient at arm's length from his ear, covering the untested ear, whispering a combination of three numbers and letters, and asking the patient to repeat what he's heard then conducting the test on the other ear. You can conduct a Weber test, which is taking a tuning fork, pressing the handle of the tuning fork to the bridge of the forehead, nose, or teeth, and asking the patient if the sound is louder in one ear or the other. You can also conduct a Rhiney test, which compares the difference between bone conduction and air conduction. You may refer for audiometry, which is a test of decibel loss of frequency pattern of loss and laterality issues. And you can conduct a geriatric hearing screening tool. So the USPSTF has recommended that aged persons be screened for hearing impairment. What is an aged person? We are going to assume at this time that an aged person is a geriatric person over the age of 65. You may also find people younger than that in your clinic who presents with symptoms of hearing loss, but for this specific PowerPoint, we're gonna assume over 65 years. There is a hearing tool called the Hearing Handicap Inventory for the Elderly. It is a quick or self-report hearing tool um, that contains questions that patients answer and you rate. Then you add up the score 
and you determine whether their hearing loss is mild, moderate, or severe. Some of the questions include, um, does a hearing problem cause you to feel embarrassed when you meet new people? Do you feel impaired by a hearing problem? Does a hearing problem cause you difficulty when listening to the television or radio? Management strategies for hearing loss in the elderly. One of the more simple management strategies for hearing loss is removing earwax in the clinic setting. You can also recommend that this be done at home using over-the-counter um, wax buildup medications or fluids. You do want to recommend or soften the hard wax first, then you can flush scoop or suction this out. This will greatly decrease the conductive hearing loss that your patient may be having. However, if you conduct an audiometry test or you're highly suspicious of moderate to severe hearing impairment, you will want to refer to audiology for the following. Hearing aids, which are digital devices that enhance select frequencies for each ear. Cochlear implants, which are devices that go directly into the inner ear and innervate the nerve there. Electric acoustic stimulation is the use of both cochlear implants and hearing aids in the same ear. A more expensive management strategy is using a middle ear implant, which is an oscular, ossicular stimulator, although ex the expense may not be covered by insurance. And you can also promote or have the audiologist promote hearing assistive technologies. These assist patients in situations like face-to-face -face communication, using the telephone, both landline and mobile phones, and detecting important warning sounds. One of the very important reasons to manage hearing impairment in your elderly populations is to decrease the risk of hearing of polypharmacy. Um, polypharmacy concerns for elder patients with hearing impairment may include not hearing medication administration regimens that have been prescribed by their providers. For example, they may not hear the correct medication name, the correct dosage, or the correct time at which to take the medication. This may put them at risk for taking the wrong meds, or for taking too many meds, or for taking meds that are not applicable to their condition. Providers also need to be careful that they are not prescribing medications that contribute to or worsen hearing impairment in the geriatric population, especially if a patient has mild hearing loss or does not disclose their hearing impairment. It is the provider's responsibility to make sure that they are not giving a patient medications which will impact their hearing, especially in the geriatric population, because as we learned earlier, the geriatric population does not, cannot regain what they have lost through degenerative processes. Vision and hearing impairment affect the geriatric population in many ways. As a provider to these patients, it is important to assess and manage these impairments with the direct involvement of these patients. By providing and suggesting management strategies, consulting with audiology and with these patients about what they want specifically, quality of life can be maintained for the rest of their lives. Vision and hearing impairment can be managed and should be. That is our responsibility. Test your knowledge of vision and hearing impairment with the following questions. Read through the case study and decide what your next plan of action may be.